Good morning, everyone. Wonderful to be with you this weekend. And, and, and my first book isn't bad, actually. It's not all that bad, but, um, but that, that's the one you want to read, really. Um, hopefully, it's a benefit to you, and there's copies out there. Um, I'm really delighted to hear about your church weekend. Um, Phil Emerson is a good friend of mine, a spiritual father in many respects, um, and you're going to be mightily blessed if you go along on that weekend with Phil and, and with one another. And just before I um, start to speak on the subject, if you weren't here yesterday, we, we gave out this little diagram, which might be helpful for you in your prayer life. It's a prayer wheel. Um, <laughs> I should have changed the title, but don't, don't let the title put you off. He thinks it's Buddhism, but it's not really. It's Christianity. If you read it, you'll find out. Uh, it's just the name prayer wheel is a bit of a stumbling block. But um, there's some of those lying about somewhere that you can get, I think. Um, before, before I start, um, this is permission now to use your mobile phone, which I know you don't need really in church. But um, there's an app. Has anybody heard of the Prayer Ireland app? Put your hand up if you've heard of the Prayer Ireland app. Oh, good, there's a few. I should have mentioned this yesterday. Well, a number of years ago, the Lord gave us a vision about an app that you could clock on to, and there'd be a calendar on it, and there'd be a 24-7 prayer covering them. I say 24-7, that's not the organization. I mean every day, every hour. Um, a, a prayer covering that you could sign up to in 15-minute increments. And um, this was designed by Chris and Julie Kitson. Does anybody know Chris and Julie? They're locals up Korean direction, I think, or near here. Uh, Leap Online is their company. And um, there's a devotional on twice a week uh, related largely to prayer or issues we might be going through. So if you haven't downloaded that and joined the movement, please do. It's prayerireland.com, or you can go to your... Uh, various app stores or whatever you're on, Android or iOS, download it and you can sign in. You have to log in, sign up to, to, to take a slot, but it's completely anonymous and so on. So that'll be a benefit to you as you go on praying for Ireland uh, to see God move. And there's also an interactive prayer map on it. Sorry, I'm getting carried away. I like all this. Um, there's an interactive prayer map of the globe. So there's little dots all over the planet where people are praying for Ireland, who've signed up for this, which is quite interesting. And thankfully, Ireland itself is a sea of, of red. It's just a red dot because of all the many people. So it's exciting. We want to get as many people praying for our, our land as possible. I want you to turn with me to uh, James chapter 4. And uh, yesterday, we looked at some prayer practicalities. All those were recorded, isn't that right? So they'll be available at some stage. And I would really encourage you to go on there and at your leisure look at both sessions. We look first of all at some practicalities of prayer, that's where the sheet comes in. And then we looked at the passionate pursuit of God. And, and I just want to emphasize that if there was a core message that I've preached over the weekend, it would be that one. That is the essence of what prayer is all about. Okay, and we can get bogged down in the mechanics of prayer um, and the wonder of it all, and the gift that it is, and miss the fact that it's only a means to an end. It's a means to an end to get to know God and to see Him face to face and commune with Him, have fellowship with Him. And um, so that was a very important um, session that I would encourage you. Please do backtrack if you can and listen to that. But we're looking at this morning confident praying. Confident praying. Are you a person that prays confidently? And that usually presupposes you're expecting answers, you're expecting something to happen. So we might call this how to get answered prayer. But we'll read um, from James chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. Just as an introduction, we're not going to be spending much time there. We're going to be looking at many scriptures um, in the time that we have. And I'll keep things as simple as we can because I want everybody to get a grasp of the fact, listen to me, you can pray confidently to God. And you can get your prayers answered. So get excited right away. I'm going to give you certain keys. They're all in the Bible, but I'm going to lift them out for you, present them to you so that you can have an effective prayer life. <coughs> Would you like that? Okay. Verse 1 of James 4. Where do wars and fights come from among you? 
do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? And we'll just skip over that verse because you would never fight among yourselves or anything like that. She wouldn't. Um, but we, we all have these inner conflicts ourselves. We fight with ourselves, but we fight with one another. Let's face it. We, we, we fall out. We get offended. We get annoyed with each other. We rub each other up the wrong way. We do each other's heads in at times. Yes? Okay. Amen. We're getting honest now. Verse 2, you lust and do not have. Now, that is not specifically talking about sexual lust, or of course it, it includes that, but it's really talking about covetousness, wanting things, whether it's sexual or whether it's material or financial or whatever. Uh, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. So there's a lot of fleshly stuff going on. I don't know that they're literally murdering people, but remember Jesus said, if you hate someone in your heart, it's tantamount to murdering them. So there's a lot of fleshly activity going on here that's manifesting, and then they're praying, and they're not, in fact, they're not even praying for anything. They're just operating in the flesh. So that's a fascinating statement. You do not have because you do not ask. And I'm, imagine standing in a Christian church on a Sunday morning and asking the question, do you pray? Do you pray? I mean, honestly, do you pray? And there are certain things called arrow prayers, you know, when you're driving to work in the morning. Oh, Lord, please help me today. You know, and I'm not despising that because that can come in very, very handy. That's not meant to be the normal prayer life of the Christian, you know, en route. We are meant to have intentionality in our praying. If we, I mean, anything that we value, we make time for and we prioritize quality time for it. Isn't that correct? And there is this strange correlation between prayers asked and prayers answered. It's not profound. There's a connection between prayers asked and prayers answered. Did you know that you tend to get more prayers answered when you've prayed? <laughs> Here ended the lesson. That was a good sermon this morning, wasn't it? But honestly, if you could take that home with you and realize it, it's like healing. More people get healed when you pray for more people to get healed. More people get saved when you evangelize and invite them and say, come and see. And go to the highways and the byways and... But then there are those who do pray, and this is referred to in verse um, 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you might spend it on your pleasures. Now this is fascinating because what this is talking about, th th these are the people who do pray, but they're praying with a wrong motivation. They're praying from a fleshly desire. They're praying selfishly, or to put a kind of more technical term on it, they are praying soulishly. Oh, there's a lot of soulish prayers go on in the Christian church. In other words, I'm praying out of just my emotions, my thinking, my ideas, and my will. What I want. And you don't get those prayers, at least not answered by God. That's a whole other subject. You might get them answered from another spirit. And there is a lot of witchcraft like that in the church, where the enemy's taking up intention, spiritual intentions from Christians that are being communicated into the spiritual realm, but they're not been lifted up by God, they've been lifted up by the enemy and used. We're not going to that one today. I said to keep it simple, but um, you have to be very careful that you're not praying from a, a place of soulishness or selfishness. And what we said yesterday was that there is a cycle of prayer. This is God's master stroke in the, uh, the, 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 the design of prayer. What happens is when we spend time with him and in his presence, he puts his desires into our hearts. We become assimilated into his, his heart and we become aligned to his desires, the plumb line of his truth. And then we start asking for his desires. And guess what happens? We get the answers to our prayers because we're asking for what he wants. Therefore, according to his will, we get it. 
That's where you want to get into God's presence, waiting in God's presence, saying, I surrender, I relinquish my will. Not my will, but yours be done. Okay? But when you do start praying even in the Spirit, that's what we would call praying in the Spirit, praying according to God's will. When you even start praying in the Spirit and know the importance of prayer, who knows it still can be hard. It's one of the most difficult things um, to do at times. It's the simplest thing, the youngest child can pray and get answers, and yet we who have on the road for a long time still have many questions around prayer, and I, and I have them as well. But I want to encourage you today to know that you can be confident in your prayer. And I'm going to give you three ingredients for confident praying or how to see your prayers answered. Here they are. First of all, there's identity. Then there is authority. And then certainty. First of all, identity, then authority, and then certainty. And I believe that if you can bring those ingredients into your prayer life, you'll begin to see a shift and a change. So let's look at identity first of all. I think it was Jack Frost who wrote a wonderful book, Embrace, uh, what is it? Embracing the Father, or no, Experiencing the Father's Embrace, that's it. Um, he said this, Jesus was the man that he was because of the Father he had. Jesus was the man that he was because of the Father he had. Now we know he's the Son of God, but when you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see this wonderful relationship between the Father and the Son. And if you want to really find out what makes Jesus tick, you've got to understand the concept of sonship and what it is to know God as your, your Father. And so when Jesus was asked, teach us to pray, the disciples said, even as John taught his disciples to pray, Jesus said, in this manner pray, therefore, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, etc. But he starts at this place of instructing the disciples to address God as their Father. Now, that was revolutionary to the Jewish mind. Um, God was seen as the Father of the nation, the Father of Israel, but he wasn't seen on the level of being your personal individual Father. And so Jesus was teaching them to pray in this manner. And of course, the Aramaic term for father is Abba, which is closely related to our term daddy. In fact, it, it, Aramaic speak, baby speak, where we, would, the, we toddlers would say mama, dada, in Aramaic it was imma, abba. Imma, mama, abba, dada. And Jesus is saying, this is the intimacy that I want you to have like I have with my heavenly Father. Now, I want you to understand, if you don't hear anything else that I say here this morning, you need to get this, that the key to coming to God in prayer is knowing your identity. To know who He is to you as your Abba Father and know who you are to Him as His son or His daughter. I'm so overjoyed that the folk in Armoy do this series that I teach on the Father Heart of God because it is the basis of the Christian life. And it certainly is the basis to all intimacy with God in prayer. And it's one of the keys to answered prayer. Knowing who God is to you. Do you know who God is to you? He's your Papa in heaven, your Abba Father. He is the Holy God of heaven, yes. Hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let's not forget about that. But He is... And what, what uh, adult would scold a child in the room for running up to his father's knee and, and getting up on it and throwing his arms around his daddy? That is the intimacy that we can have as sons and daughters of God, and it's just beautiful. Do you know who he is to you, and do you know who you are to him and what you mean to him? I said yesterday I don't really like talking about prayer per se, on his own, because we as Christians can be so formulaic and legalistic, and we, we love to get hold of tools that are very often not relational. But prayer is all about relationship. It's all about being sons and daughters in the family of God and relating to our Father. We bow our knees to the Father after whom every family in heaven and earth has been named. That's what Paul says in Ephesians. This is what got Jesus through his temptation and his fasting and praying in the wilderness. Do you remember Satan came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, twice he said that, 
first two temptations. If you are the son of God, he ta- attacked his relationship. He attacked the basis of his intimacy with God. And of course, Jesus replied to him with scripture. But I want you to consider that the chapter before chapter 4 of Matthew, where we find the temptation in the wilderness, is the baptism of Jesus. And it was his, at- his baptism that the heavens cleft open. And of course, the Holy Spirit came down in the form like of a dove, but the voice from heaven spoke and said, the Father speaking, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased and in whom is all my delight. Isn't it interesting that when Satan came to Jesus to tempt him, he left one word out. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. What word did he leave out that God spoke? Beloved. God said, not you're my son, but you're my, but this is my beloved son. And you see, when we lose that belovedness and the sense of, of our acceptance and belonging as sons and daughters of God and who God is as our father, that's when we start to fall down, okay, into temptation. And, and that's when we lose hold of what it is to really enter in in prayer with God. This is what God Jesus through his temptation, holding on to his belovedness as the Son of God. In John chapter 5, you remember Jesus said those words, I only do what I see the Father do. This is the cooperation of intimacy and fellowship between the Father and the Son. In John chapter 11, verse 41 and 42, we read this. Jesus said, praying, Father, I thank you that you have heard me and I know that you always hear me. What about that for confident praying? But it's because he knew he was his father. And he knew that he was his son. You always hear me. But it's because of these people standing here that I say this. That they may believe that you've sent me. I don't need to say this. Because I know deep down that you always. Imagine saying that. Thank you that you always hear me. And then John 13 verse 3 Just before Jesus washes the disciples' feet, it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. Isn't that wonderful? The reason why he could get down in the dirt and wash the disciples' feet when no one else was prepared to do it was because he knew who he was. And you can get down on your knees in the dirt and pray and intercede and sweat, as it were, great drops of blood in prayer if you know who you are. He knew he'd come from God, and he knew he was gone to God, and God had given him everything. Then John 17, which is known as his great high priestly prayer, uh, in verse 22 and 23, it says this. He prays, Lord, the glory which you gave me, I have given them, his disciples, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me, listen, and have loved them as you have loved me. Whew. Did you hear that? That you, Father, have loved them as you have loved me. Now, if you get a touch of that love, I'm telling you, you'll never be the same again, and you'll never pray the same again. Because you understand who you are before God, as a son or daughter of God. It's incredible. And of course, Jesus previously in John 15, there's a lot of of this in John He talks about verse 7 to 19. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, he's speaking to his disciples. You will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples as the Father has loved me. I also have loved you. Abide in me. It's all about abiding in the love of the Father and the Son together. It's just wonderful. You know, we talk about inviting Jesus into our lives. And I'm not saying there's anything particularly wrong with that, but it's even greater than that. Jesus invites us into his life. The whole triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are saying, come on in and enjoy the fellowship, enjoy the love, and enjoy the answers to prayer, knowing who you are as one of us being with us. One of us. I don't mean that we're gods, but what I mean is we're in God because God is, Christ is in God and we are in Christ. Did you get this? This is sinking in. Your identity. He is your Abba. 
And maybe the problem is you've got God all wrong. You think he's at a distance. Or you've had bad theology or brought up in a church where it's all about God just wanting to zap you and drop you in hell or whatever it is. And you've never understood this, this truth of being adopted into God's family. And God is your father and you as his child. And all that that means. And there are many ramifications of that. But that means that there's a father in heaven. And every time Jesus talked about prayer, he, he, he used this it's not a figure, it's a reality of children coming to a father, of, of people coming to judges that are cruel, and God is not like that. That's what those parables are all about. God is the antithesis of a just judge. God is your Abba. He is your father. And this is why he said in Matthew 7 and verse 11, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good gifts to you? Now look talks about the Holy Spirit, giving the Holy Spirit to you. But Matthew just generalizes. God is able to give good gifts to you. If you understand he's your Father, he needs, knows your need before you even ask it, and you can come to him. And, and as long as you understand your identity, that's the first step, first huge step of getting your prayers answered. You with me? Do you know who you are? Do you really? Do you know who he is to you? The second thing is authority, and that, that outflows from identity. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, John again, um, you know the famous verse, to as many as received him and, and believed in his name, to them he gave the, what does some of the versions say? The right to become the sons of God. Some versions say the power to become the sons of God. Some say the authority to become the sons and the daughters of God. Of God. The Amplified Version translates it like this. But as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the right, in brackets, the authority, the privilege to become children of God. That is to those who believe in or adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name. The word that's translated variously, power, right, and authority, is the Greek word exousia. The word in Greek for power generally is the word dunamis that we get dynamite from. And that's, that, that's just like dynamite power, you know, a dislodging power, dynamic power, miracle working power. But exousia is a different kind of word. It means the authority to do something, the right to do something. And John is saying that when we're the sons and daughters of God and we've received and welcomed him into our lives and believed in his name, we now have authority to be called children, but also authority to claim an inheritance because we're children. Do you know who you are? Yeah? Do you know who he is to you? Well, the next question is, do you know what you have because of that? Do you? The authority that you have as children of God. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8 for a moment. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Wonderful passage of Scripture all about inheritance and so forth. But look at verse 15. Or verse 14 even. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God, the daughters and sons of God. Remember in Bible times it was only sons that inherited. That's why it talks sons of God, but we male and female all inherit in Christ. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. That's what we're talking about. Adoption. By whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And watch this. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Verse 17 says, If we're adopted in God's family, he's our father, our Abba, and we're his kids, then we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus. That, that just blows my mind. Do you know what that means? We are in the will. We are in the will, inheriting the wealth of of God. The inheritance. And that means because Jesus is God's son, he's obviously in the will. He's his unique son, his only begotten son. But because we are now all sons and daughters by adoption, whatever Jesus gets in the will, we get. Not even split in half. 
It's whatever is His becomes ours. Does this excite you? Really? (laughs) Whatever is coming to Jesus and His Father's will is yours. And part of that is authority. It's also suffering, by the way. But we'll quickly skirt over that in verse 17. That's not so palatable on a Sunday morning. But seriously, that is part of the inheritance of Christ, is suffering for His name. But I want to talk about authority, and and I want you in your mind's eye to go to that moment when Jesus is about to ascend into heaven after spending 40 days with the disciples talking about the kingdom of God. And he gives them the great commission, and he spoke to them saying, all authority, all exousia has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, that means everywhere. (laughs) That means everywhere over everything. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. The reason why we're not doing so well, really, with the Great Commission is because we haven't understood the authority that we have. And we haven't utilized the authority of Christ being in Christ. He is far above all principalities and powers, might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. He's above it all. And he has given us authority in his name to go out and preach the gospel. In Luke chapter 10, 19, he said, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, you either believe that or you don't. And all the power of the enemy either means all the power of the enemy, or it doesn't. Well, it does. And that's the authority that we have in Christ. Now, there's ways to move in that, and there's safety, and there's covering, and there's all those spiritual things we need to learn in community of God's people. This isn't to individuals just to go out and be crazy people and lone rangers and spiritual power rangers. No, that's not what this is about. This is is spoken to the, the community, the body of Christ's people together as they move in agreement, but under the authority of Jesus, even in Matthew 18, 18. And I know there's a context to it, but he gives authority to bind and to loose certain things. And he actually tells us that what we do on a certain spiritual level here on the earth is recognized in heaven by God. That's the type of authority that we're, we're given in Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, we read that all the promises of God in Jesus are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through him. So, It's all linked. The identity of who we are in Christ as sons and daughters before the Father, outflowing that comes authority, and that means all the promises God ever spoke are fulfilled in Jesus, and we live in the good of them and the inheritance that we have in Him. Isn't that wonderful? Ephesians 1 talks about it, that we're in Christ. Therefore, we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. All spirits, say it, all, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in in Christ. And because He is risen, we are risen with Him. Because He is seated at the right hand of the Father, we are seated at the right hand of the Father. It's all about identifying with Christ and realizing the authority that we have. And the problem is we don't believe any of it, largely speaking. That's the problem. We don't really believe this. If you believed you are the authority of Jesus Christ, what would you not do in Balamoni Town or wherever you're from? What would you be afraid of? See, Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, He that comes to God must believe that he is and is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Because without faith it is impossible to please God. You see, we need the faith to believe who we are, who God is to us, and what we have, our identity and our authority. And then finally, the third key. Are you still with me? Certainty. Certainty. So this is confident prayer. Praying, knowing who you are, identity, who God is, your authority, what you have, and then knowing the certainty. So this comes from the faith. So if you believe who you are, and you believe what you have, there's a certainty that comes in prayer. I want you to turn to Mark 11 for this. (laughs) 
Mark 11. I can't remember when I started. That is the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. I can't remember, but I hope I'm all right, am I? Um, Mark 11, verse 20. This is the lesson from the cursing of the fig tree that was withered. If you don't know what that is, you need to read from verse um, 11 or so. Uh, verse 12. But we'll not do that just now. Jesus cursed the fig tree because it had no fruit on it. And then the disciples are walking by it again the next day. And they're saying, what was that all about? And they asked him a few questions. In the morning, verse 20, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembered, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Now, your margin, or the footnote might render that, have the faith of God, because that is a rendering. It is, a, 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 I'm told, a reliable rendering of the Greek here. Not just have faith in God, but have the faith of God. So this is faith that God gives as a gift. You know one of the gifts of the Spirit. It's not so much talked about like tongues and prophecy and so on, miracles. It, one of the gifts of the Spirit is the gift of faith. And that is that God gives you this certainty this assurance that something is going to be and you just know, you know, you know, you know it will be. And that's not standing in front of the mirror and saying, I do believe, I will believe, I will believe, and trying to work yourself up. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a divine deposit of grace that comes into your spirit that you just know something. It's absolutely assured that it's going to happen. You're certain. And Jesus is saying, have the faith of God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes uh, that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, and mark this, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So he's saying these insurmountable obstacles, that's what, he's not meaning literal mountains now. So don't be going up to the morns and saying, in Jesus' name, Steve Donard, move. All right? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about insurmountable obstacles, things that get in our way in life. And if we have even a little bit of faith, and don't doubt, we can see those things removed in Jesus' name according to the will of God. Um, but he gives us this principle in verse 24, and I want you to look at it. I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, so first of all, you have to ask and you have to pray. Believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, this is counterintuitive to our way of thinking. Believe that you receive them and you will have them. Because we tend to think, I'll believe I've received it when I have it. Do you know what I mean? So if I was to give my iPhone to someone and really say, I want you to keep this, you would only really believe me when you're kind of walking out of Connect Church here today in the car and you're halfway down the motorway and you know you've got my iPhone. Do you, do you understand? We tend to only believe those matters of receiving stuff when we've got it, when we're holding in our hand. Now, that is common sense. It's even reasonable on, on a human level. But that is not faith sense. Faith sense is believing you have the thing before you actually have it in your hands. And in fact, Hebrews 11 talks about faith as being the the evidence of things not seen, the Amplified Version talks about it as the title deed of things not seen. So you've actually got the, the evidence that you own the thing, even though you're not, it would appear, in material possession of the thing. That's faith. And Jesus is saying that's what you need to see these miraculous things done. So what does that look like? That means, now again, it's, it's being in God's presence. It, it's abiding in fellowship with Him. You know, that, then God gives you his desires and then God gives you his faith. Then you start having confidence asking for what he wants. And when you're asking for what he wants, you can believe that you've got it before you even see it. But it's all in this prayer fellowship cycle. You can't just jump in and blab and glab it, grab it, you know, name and claim it, that type of thing. Uh, you can't just do that. It's not, this is nothing to do with human will on its own. This is to do with being in fellowship with God. And when you're in fellowship with God, I'm telling you, nothing is impossible. One more passage in keeping with that. First John 5. First John 5. Uh, it's the same idea, verse 14 and 15. First John 5, 14 and 15. 
And we're talking about confident praying. And John begins by saying, this is the confidence. This is the confidence that we have in Him, in God, in Jesus. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Can I say something? That is what it means to pray in Jesus' name. To pray in Jesus' name is actually recognizing your identity. You're in Christ. I am standing in Christ who's in God when I'm asking for this. It's to recognize your authority. I've got the authority of Jesus as a joint heir and a son and daughter of God. And it gives you the confidence when you're praying according to his will. That's also praying in Jesus' name. You can't pray in Jesus' name, Lord, get rid of my wife and want another one. We're laughing, but some people are praying that way. Seriously. They're saying, God brought me a new wife and blah, blah, blah. You know, that's not praying in Jesus' name. Praying in Jesus' name is not tagging on in Jesus' name at the end of a prayer. There's power in the name of Jesus. But it's much, much more than that. It's being in line with everything of identity, authority, and confidence. Certainty. So you've got to pray according to this book. You've got to pray according to the revealed will of God. And you've got to pray according to the rhema word of God that God is speaking into your life every day as you're abiding in Him. As He gives you words of faith. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I said yesterday, one of the most important lessons in the Christian life entirely is starting to hear the voice of God. Those that are the sons of God, they are led by the Spirit of God. Let's read on. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. So if you ask according to God's will, you know it's His will, and you ask in faith, you know that He hears us. And if you know that He hears you, then you know that you have what you ask. And it's not about seeing it. It's not about handling it at that moment. It's about believing it with the gift of faith in your heart that God has given you. Not that you've worked up, but that God has given you. Because of what God has said. Because of what God has promised. And that's vital. That you're standing on the foundation of what God has said. Let me illustrate it to you like this. And I'm almost finished. If someone came to you and said, I've asked Jesus to be my Savior and forgive me my sins, but I don't feel saved. I don't feel a Christian. What would you say? What would you say? It's not about feelings initially. Feelings do come and feelings should come. But that's not what it's, it's about what? It's about faith. And it's about faith in the facts of what God says. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He died for his sins, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It's all about putting your, your trust and your faith uh, in, in what he has said, what he has promised. Well, can I tell you, everything in the Christian life is like that. Everything. Feelings do come after. But everything initially is it's from, from faith to faith. It's a faith exercise from start to finish. It's taking God at his word and standing on it. And so you will say to that person, well, you need to start to believe. You need to start believe God has heard you. You need to start believe God wants to save you. That's his will. He doesn't desire that any... I think I'm preaching the gospel to somebody. <laughs> it's God's will that you're saved. He doesn't desire that anybody is lost. But it all comes to repentance. And if you cry to him this morning, no matter how young or old you are, if you cry to him, he will hear you. But you've got to believe he hears you in order to have the assurance. And it's exactly the same with prayer. You've got to believe. You've got to be praying according to his will. But you've got to believe that he hears you in order to have the assurance that he hears you. And that is called the committal of faith. The committal of faith. Who grew up in a Christian home here? Who asked Jesus into their heart nearly every night of the week? Okay, And then there came a time when you had to say, right, for me anyway, you drew a line, you say, I'm, I'm taking this now. I'm going to believe this now. I'm really going, I can't keep doing this. I have to believe it. That's the committal of faith. Well, you, you actually believe God's heard you. It's like writing a letter, a, a Christmas card, forget about the postal strike for a moment, and you put a stamp and address on it, and you put it in the letter box, and you commit it to the postal system. And you don't bite your nails for a week worrying, is it going to arrive? And it's not guaranteed to arrive, but you don't do that. You commit it to the system. That's what we need to do in prayer, because he is more, praise God, reliable than royal mail. <laughs> and he doesn't go on strike. This is how, it's not, the, it's not exhaustive, but the, these are three ways to help us to pray confidently. But guess what? 
you got to go and do it. you got to go and do it. Let's pray. And let me just quote a verse as we come to pray about committal. And this might be a verse for some folk here this morning. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will act. Commit your way, committal. By faith, roll it over to the Lord. Trust in Him, believe in Him, and He will act, He will do it. So, Lord, I pray that as Paul prayed at the beginning of this week, weekend, you will pour out a spirit of grace and supplication, a spirit of prayer, the Holy Spirit, spirit of intercession upon this, this company of people. You will put your desires in their heart. You will break their heart for what breaks yours. You will reveal your will to them that they may pray with a confidence, understanding who they are before you, the authority they have, and the fact that you love, you desire, you delight to answer prayer. Take them on a prayer journey they've never been on before, Lord. And I thank you for them, their fellowship and their kindness in the gospel. And I bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.